Right. We are now recording. We're meeting with Marcus Lindenbrink. So, Marcus, I think this is fascinating. I have so many dichotomies to resolve with you. Um, where were you born? Where were you raised? You're like European, aren't you? Yep. <laughs> I, was, I was born in Dortmund, which is like a city that's kind of in that big jungle, the industrial jungle that's kind of like Detroit now, where all the industry died and everybody had to reinvent themselves. Then um, I lived, I had like a, a short stint in Eastern Europe with my family, where I lived in Romania for two years that I have a very fond and vivid memory of. How old were you then? then? I was like third grade or so. How old are you now? Uh, I was born 61, so you can do the math. I don't want to say. Like 28? Yeah. (laughs) Again, no, I'm 53. (laughs) Okay, cool. All right, and and, 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 and did you you think you were going to be an artist when you were a little child, or did you think you were going to be a football star? No, I was, I was, I was the artist guy. It's like when I was fourteen, I was like, "That's what I want to do." Far out. Did I you had no idea you? what it would mean, you know? So, where, where was that? That was still in Germany. Yeah, yeah, that was in Germany in school in Dortmund. Back in Dortmund, then. Mm-hmm. Was it respected to be an artist, or were you picked on because you were an artist? Nah, you know, it's, I didn't like advertise it too much at school. You know, I mean, there, there was like, like everywhere, you find like that circle of artistic people that are kind of into what you are and then you have a small group that kind of understands what's what what's important for you you know and then i applied to art school and then i was like i wanted to go a good school back then was hamburg and i went there with my with my um my my selection of stuff and they the, the, this one guy was just like it was so embarrassing. It was like you know what you better go and be like a, a kids book illustrator or something. I was like oh thank you very much. And then um, I applied to a different school parallel, so they didn't take me in Hamburg. And then I applied to a school in Kassel, which was a really sad town back then because it was right to the German German border, and was little and documenta was just over when I started. Uh, to study there. So I stayed three years there and then I couldn't send anymore. And then I went to Berlin and finished art school in Berlin in the eighties. When did the Berlin wall come down? 89. I just left in that summer. <laughs> I was only there. I was in Berlin for four years. Interesting. So Berlin, so Berlin's very different than that now. So, so, but at, at, at some point you made this amazing move to get exposure in the United States. What possessed you? How did you do that? I mean, I think this is really significant. You know, like I, you know, like, I mean, I live from what I do for 25 years now. So this is like, I'm, I'm really happy about that. But I never had like this like whoosh, career that just takes off, you know. So I kind of had to kind of pay attention. You know, I was not just like pushed like higher and higher so it's like so you meet people sometimes you're lucky right time right spot and then you have a relationship and that goes on for a while and then um i had at that moment i had a gallerist um and she was very eager to travel to to the u.s and and find people that she thought would might be interesting in cologne and cologne was back then like really the center in the in the uh, late 80s, early 90s still. I mean, Berlin tried to be something, but it wasn't there yet. And the art market till then was in definitely in Cologne. You know, and there's like a, a huge uh, back and forth. It was there between New York and, and Cologne. And a lot of artists got really big. And like New York artists got really big in, in Germany through that kind of connection. So she was traveling in, in the U.S. And she kind of uh, had connections to galleries where she picked artists that she would like to show in Germany alone but then she also tried to make an entry for some of her artists somewhere and I, I was but basically I like if I remember correctly I was the only one that really kind of got a foothold in the US and so at a certain point I was just like I had somebody in Chicago Roy Boyd whom you right. know that I stuck so he gave me my first show in the US but then outside the show Emma, that happened as a result of this woman and not as a result of making a connection no those people came to New York and like Roy and Anne they were traveling so they came to Cologne I met them we talked and then they decided to do that and so I worked for a while in Chicago and had my first show there how I'm not sure how relevant it is but how did you meet Roy and Anne Boyd Roy Boyd Gallery 
Did they come? I mean, did, was it through? I, I'm, I'm curious where the introduction came from. I thought you. Well, came from my, from my, that was that came through the Cologne Gallery. Okay. Because they picked up somebody that she really liked from Roy's stable, and so she kind of like tried to make a deal there and and help one of her artists to to get a bigger exposure. And she was, she was like this gallerist was one of the few galleries that I met that really understand that it's important for artists to be able to, 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 to show in different places, to grow, and that that grows ultimately falls back onto the gallery that if the gallery is still working with that artist, you know. Do you feel at all identified by geography? Do you feel identified by living in Brooklyn? Do you feel identified as an American? Do you feel a, as a German? Are you international? How do you feel? No, you know, I, can, I cannot... Uh, I cannot deny that I'm German because I lived there most of my life and it's like the way I sing most of the time. I mean, I sing in English and dream in English right now, but I mean, it's like, it, I almost feel like I had two lives, one in Germany and I have a life in the US somehow. But I, I you know, I love Brooklyn and everything, but it's like, I, who gives a shit about the Brooklyn hype, whatever. There's good things happening here, but good things happen everywhere, you know? So it's like, um, so it's like I don't really I I I like I think I identify by now as a person that does what I do best, you know, and that that is like gives me a nice center. Yeah, I need to go in two directions here. Let's go the odd one. Um, you, I didn't realize until this weekend that you have an eight-year-old daughter. Ooh. She's only six year old. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you told me she was eight. <laughs> no, no, I, I told you. you. You probably miss. But she's six. Okay, fine. And but, my, I, my, but to add to the awkwardness or whatever, or to the odd line, I, I also have a 25 year old son. Okay, I'm, so now I, 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 wait, are you living with the mother of your daughter? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, are you married? Yeah. I, is that the same woman who's the mother of your son? No. Okay. No, I've, been, I've been married before, so that's what I'm saying. I had a German life, and I have a life in New York. Interesting. Okay, but see, I, I find it fascinating that you know artists with children, and particularly, I think it's an issue for female artists. I mean, oh yeah, I think no, you look I've... at an artist like Michelle Grabner, who's someone we did a webinar with previously, and has done the Whitney Biennial, and domesticity and being a mother is part of what goes on in her artwork. Yeah. Um, and you were just in Miami for the Miami Basel Art Fairs, and you were in Miami for four or five days, and you took your daughter with you. For, you took your daughter with you. Yeah, so that's how I did not end up on any of the fancy parties. <laughs> but I had like you know, some some good meetings that really kind of were more important than being on a party, you know. But to add like to the story, I, like my twenty-five-year-old son is at the academy in Düsseldorf studying to become a painter. So there we go. I couldn't keep him away from that. Nice try. Um, so how does your daughter, I mean, I, I think for a female artist, taking care, picking up my daughter at school, et cetera, is important. You yeah. and I had to do a dry run for this webinar. And I, re I mean, I have three kids and I would deliver art as a gallery person. I would deliver art and hang it in people's homes. Yeah. And I would easily bring one or two of my children with me to some fancy person's house and say, sit there, be polite. Um, don't eat all the candy. And, um, you know, I mean, so, but I'm, I'm wondering for you, I mean, you know, I, I'm interested in what it's like as a male artist to have a six-year-old daughter and how does it affect your art making? How does it affect your career? Does your wife have to do every, I'm assuming wife, does your partner have to do everything to accommodate your career? Or does no, she no, 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 no. Oh, no. How does, what's going on? No, she, she's in, in Miami and she took an extra day just to relax on the beach because she was working in an art fair for seven days. So, and I'm here with my child, you know, so I like, I, I take care of the, the things of folded clothes over there on the sofa, you know, it's like the everyday stuff is just part of, of your life. You know, I was like, when I was young, I was like, yeah, there's, there are, I had this ideal, so, you know, like, yeah, you got to be like, in your studio all the time, it's going to be awesome, and that's what you do, you know. But in reality, is you have to fight for your your studio time all the time, you know. So it's like you have everyday life, and that overlaps, you know. And you can't, there's, like, you can't really exist in an artistic vacuum, you know. Well, so then, all right, you're begging a question here too, because a lot of your studio time is public. I mean, a lot of what you do, a lot of the art you make, is fairly bold, big, big, brave, gestural, outdoor. Well big scale. 
Um, 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 what's the difference? Is there a difference? Can you do you make changes in when? How premeditated is a large scale piece? It still has a lot of experimentation, doesn't it? No, it, it 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 has it has a performative aspect to it. I realized at a certain point. I was just doing it, and then I realized, yeah, what you do is like you paint in public somewhere. I mean, I painted. I have like several funny kind of weird stories where like I had like one of the the awkward stories was where I had a commission. It was like a public spa, like a, like a recovery health spa thing, and so it was a, a an old building older building and a new construction so i had to do a, I, I did a painting that like uh, connected old and new and the one part that was done the stucco that i was supposed to paint on cracked so they had to totally redo it so but they also kept the opening date of the spa so i was like painting with a friend of mine while like the older generation was like doing their water gymnastics and watching us and giving us shit for what we were doing. <laughs> it, was, it was hysterical. Yeah. And then I painted in museums when they were uh, not close for the public too, you know. So it's like this kind of, the and, and, and I had like a super exposed uh, uh, two day painting period at the Hammer Museum because one of those walls that I painted around the corner is right as a bus stop on these super busy streets, you know. So I had people sitting there looking, giving me comments through the windows. And it's kind, of, it's kind of interesting. Even the, the last thing that I did in, in Pennsylvania, <coughs> the, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, the, the huge lobby is like, it's a huge glass lobby. And I was there like basically from 11 to midnight every day. And people walk by and I would recognize people that would walk by and you have like everybody walks by and everybody, like a lot of people gave me comments and stuff. And it's kind of fun. So you're good, you're good with people. That's nice. Yeah. Um, how different is it functioning in Europe and how different is it if Europe and the United States from each other? In terms of like what I like here is that people are not shy with their reactions, you know, especially when they like something. People get enthusiastic and you get like an immediate um, reaction on stuff when they enter a show or, or like an installation, things like that, you know, and it's in, in Germany, people are way more reserved and they, they kind of think about if they're allowed to like what they see or if they can, if they themselves allow themselves to, to like what they see. So yeah, I understand. So I was thinking more about how is it different to do business in, with galleries in Europe and galleries in the U.S. Um, First of all, do all galleries in the U.S. sort of kind of do business similarly as opposed to all galleries in Europe, or do they all do it sort of kind of similarly? No, I would say internationally there's, a, there's pretty much an, uh, like the same standard in a certain way. I think so. Yeah. And yeah. Then, that's that's like the and especially by now like most of the galleries have to travel internationally to fairs to kind of make it around it's like my gallery in berlin would not survive by now from the sales they make in berlin because berlin still has no good collector base you know it was like the burst uh, of the bubble like the euphoria bubble had ha had to happen at a certain point you know so it's like Berlin has a lot of showcase because a lot of people traveled there, but it doesn't really have a have a collector base that Cologne used to have. Like Cologne was one, really one of these cities where people would collect and 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 support the galleries like tremendously. How much do you calculate changes in your career? How much do you calculate when I all right now I want to work with resin? Now I want to do drips. Now I want to do, want to do shit that hangs off the edge of the canvas. Now I want to do things that are big. How much do you premeditate this and wonder how anybody will feel, or how much do we just check in with Marcus? <laughs> no, I, I don't premeditate too much, but, like, my work is, is in, like, I have, like, this kind of stream of stuff going on in the studio all the time, so I pay attention to what I do, and I try to filter out, like, new developments out of it or kind of things that interest me, I, I then focus on and see if I could turn that in an, into a new body of work. So that's kind of the way how, how, how that works for me. So it's not really too calculated. I love to do big stuff, but you can, can't always sell big stuff, you know. But then with a certain kind of work, I kind of lost interest in doing it in a smaller scale. So I'm just producing it in a bigger scale or in a, like 
the minimum scale is like maybe four by four feet, you know. So those are things that do happen, but it's, uh, I have one assistant. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> I just saw that popping up there. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a funny story because, I mean, I never really thought about it. Like I had a, like a few assistants that would be like there for rapping and doing like a certain like more random stuff. And I was like kept the painting and everything that belonged to painting to myself. And then, um, I once had a female assistant, but she couldn't even really use the drills. I was like so sad that she kind of fulfilled the cliche that women like, you know, I was like, you know, artist, come on, you should be able to, but she wasn't like, she wasn't that very great. But then I had two guys. The, the, and after that, right now I have a great assistant and she's a, she's a woman again. And she's like, she's, uh, she's a very good painter. I like her work a lot. And um, she really, like I asked her, do you want to do that? It's very physical, you know, and I'm like, I'm happy to give you the job, but you know, you don't really have to want it. So we had a little bit of time to, for her to, to get into it and see if she really likes it. And she loves her job by now. And so that's really cool. And I'm very happy with her. And it's nice to have a little bit of a mature person in the studio. Does having an assistant make you be more responsible? No, I don't know. I never thought about it that way. It's kind of like, you know, I try, I try to keep the job for my assistant interesting. And when I learned that, for example, um, um, Gene Davis, he would have assistants too, and he would let the people, like, he would tell them, okay, you do this, like paint those stripes in a green, whatever, you know. And then the assistant had, like, free choice or a relative broad choice to do stuff. And then he would come back and look at it and react on it and kind of have like an outside hand in his work. And I find that very interesting. So I tell like um, Kelly, go do like some, and she, she did a layer that she called like Barbie vomit. And I was like, I was totally in love with that expression. So I'm like, that's awesome. So do that and then do something else. Bar Barbie vomit. Yeah. Um, yeah, I found the same kind of thing too. You know, I mean, that other people's decisions frequently have, are, are, are okay also. It may not be the same as what I would do, but they're just as good as what I would do. Oh, yeah. And that frequently that provides some kind of freshness and input. I think validating your assistants helps make them do a better job. I think maybe they provide, you know, something that, uh, you know, you learn from. Yeah. So that was a quick question that I saw. Should I, like, jump on these questions? I mean, I'm fine to do that because it makes my life easier to... to Go for it. Yeah, so there was a question about this, the, the organic sculptures, and um, they're not solid, otherwise you couldn't move them. I mean, the resin would make them so heavy that like, they would like, crash through the floor somehow. It's also, yeah, it's also like the, the, um, the amount of money you would have poured into those is like ridiculous. And, and it's not really necessary that they're 100% solid because they get heavy enough too, like the larger ones, you need like four people to move them around. So that was one of the questions, yeah. Right. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Hey, There's something that? about the photo. I used to work with photography in a different way before, where I would like, there was a time when, when not everything was digital yet, so people would still have photos, travel photos, and then you would go and have them printed. So like, you would end up with like hundreds and thousands of photos of stuff, you know? And so I was like, I started to use those as kind of a layer of memory underneath of painting and would like drill holes into them and stuff like that and layer on top of them. And so kind of merge photography and paint together. And what I do now is that like after my dad passed away, I kind of went through this archive. And uh, as I mentioned before, we lived in Romania. My dad traveled all over the world world for work so i have this big uh archive of slides that i enlarge and then paint on so it's like the the idea that i take uh, personal history where a lot of time like relatively but some time has passed and they become like bigger because of the context they come from and 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 uh, the time that they were taken so the vintage aspect of those is pretty interesting to me and that they're personal you know and then they're, they're I merged them with, with paint and kind of forced something together in, in a way. I mean, I really like it. 
Is that what's most important? Your response? Do you, how do you? What's the deal? How, I mean, have you done bodies of work that have not been well received? Do you stop because they haven't been well received? What do you do? No, not really. I, I like I sometimes I slow down on things, but then I they I pick them up again. So I I, I realize at a certain point that I um, I'm the only person that is in my way. So. Like you should yeah. have to do what you want, you know. So, and I, I decided that I allow myself to go in circles and pick up things that were once interesting, and then maybe revisit them in a, after a while and see what they can still do for you, you know, for myself, you know. So that's that's a huge, nice liberation, you know. You can like make your life much easier by doing that. How about rules? What about the, what's the role of rules in your work? I don't, ha I don't really have rules. You know, what I try to do is create, you know, I'm not a big fan of the whole artist genius thing and the suffering and the throwing away and destroying and being all like psycho in the studio. So I basically have a way of working where there's almost no mistakes. So I can always right. add something. I mean, there, there, there's some mistakes that can happen, but that would be like st uh, stupid uh, behavior with materials. For example, in the summer, my studio gets really hot, and then the epoxy like reacts like super fast. So I had the decision of installing. My studio is not that small, so I could have installed an air conditioner for like fifteen grand or whatever for the space, and have like a five hundred, six hundred dollar uh, electricity bill, or buy it for ninety nine cent a little wine fridge where I keep the resin in the summer, so it's totally cooled down. So that extends my work time with the resin to to a time. Uh, where I'm able to do what I need to do with it. Interesting. Uh, I went for the $99. <laughs> I, I would probably also. Yeah. Sam, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for joining us. Um, your work um, really bridges the world of design and the world of you know, contemporary abstract art. And I'm, I'm sort of curious as to whether you see there are differences there or in you know, whether your, your thinking comes out of more from like the Bauhaus school of thinking. I'm definitely influenced there, but it's like, I, I never really, you know, I like the, I like the, 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 the tension when like you, you move out of that box where abstract art usually has to be. And then I did this body of like vases, you know? So it's like, kind of like, it's like one of those freedoms I took, you know, and these vases came from just, reusing um old uh or empty uh drinking container like like liquid containers uh, usually like from like bottles that are like like grapefruit juice or soda or whatever you know and then kind of honoring the form that a designer once gave this bottle and, and like I, I made some of the pom pomegranate juice bottles you know that which are really beautiful and they like kind of remind you of the the, the endless brancusi things you know and that kind of stuff so it's like it was very kind of interesting to be able in the studio practice to to squeeze in a, a body of work that has like connection to these design things and then yeah. also creates this this kind of circle or spiral where designers take from art and i was taking back from design and pushed it more back into art and then i created little objects that weren't that expensive that you can on top use you know and that was kind of like um i liked it so i did it for a while um at the point where I thought I did enough of those, I just let it go again. Yeah. Hmm. But then the, the other things, like when I'm, I mean. So, so wait, can I just yeah. say something? So oh, yeah, sure. um, your form is your content. The form you choose is the, is the content. You know, like if you're looking at abstract work, I guess I'm trying to understand more like um, <coughs> at it from an aesthetic point of view and you're tweaking your no, I think I think my work more comes out of the the, the process yeah and the attention that I pay to process you know it's like yeah. you know the wall paintings that I did and started it's like you know you take a brush you stick it in liquid paints and you like make a horizontal move and then paint runs down because it's like liquid and whatever it's like such a simple basic thing so I picked up this it, like extremely yeah. basic act of painting yeah. and, and turned it into something very complex, you know? And I'm mm -hmm. still shocked that nobody else did that before, you know? 
mm-hmm. in a way. So there, there's other things where, like, I mean, I'm, I'm like, I let paint run down a surface. You know, that's not. I'm not the only person doing that, but yeah, it was something that made part of the body of my work. But now, right. Well, yeah. they're beautiful. Your pieces. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Now, Peter Zimmerman, when I started to paint, like paint paint he was doing very conceptual work where he would like take cardboard boxes and would like stretch uh writing on them or he would do little little reclam like there's this this uh publisher in germany reclam and they do like little they're very sweet because they have they're super bright they do like travel books and they also do other books and so he picked those and, and turned those into paintings you know before he started to get more colorful and and in like the way what he's doing now i mean i always knew about his work but it was never i think he's he's maybe a few years older than me so but there was a question that popped up, popped up there yeah yeah did you see the one above it Pardon? did you see the question above that one no what can was you, that can you talk a little bit about your technique with resin and the drip paintings and how you're working that? How you do okay, so it? Can I, let me just check. So if I click on chat, it opens up the questions. Yeah, I right. guess. <coughs> okay. Let's see what there. Technique? Mm-hmm. What do you mean? Mm-hmm. What, what do you want to know? I don't know. Hold on. Wait a minute. Betsy, let me unmute you. Oh, look at there are all these people up there with legitimate questions. Hold on, Betsy. You're gonna we're gonna bump you to the head of the list. Go ahead, Betsy. Ask your question. In yeah, German. I was I was just um, I'm blown away by your work. Uh, uh, <laughs> just stunning. Uh, I've ne- <laughs> I was I was not familiar with it at all. Um, but the you know the preciseness of of these drip paintings um i was just wondering if you could speak to your your techniques um, some you know just briefly of you know how you achieve that precision it's it's gravity basically you know <laughs> it's, it's not very hard to do you know i have a guy in chicago who copies my work and and runs around selling like mediocre uh, <laughs> pieces that are made in the same way you know <laughs> So well, that's like what I do is like I, I take the resin. It's it's a two component resin. It's kind of <laughs> gooey. It's, gooey. It's, it's like a slow liquidy like honey, a little more liquid than honey maybe. And I, I put pigments in, and that was was putting dry pigments in. I can achieve whatever uh, 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 translucency or opacity I, I want to get, and then I just use it. You know. Yeah, but I mean, do you do? Are they? You said it's on wood. So are they like like? strips of of lightweight wood or something that you dip each piece in i mean uh, no they're, they're not they're not dipped you know the the painting sits on the wall it's a little bit more complex like i have um a really good carpenter who creates these panels that i work with because the resin makes them really heavy so they are pretty elaborate um and then uh for the drip pieces for the the pieces where the paint runs down they get gessoed and then i I create a background painting on those and watercolors and other materials. And then <coughs> there's a clear coat of resin. And then I start to let the resin run down on top of it, you know, and then to the point where I think the painting is good and finished. Yeah. Well, they're beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Betsy. Um, I don't know the order of these people. I'm going to go first to Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Go ahead. Hi. Thank you for joining us today. This is great. Um, I'm Canadian. Okay. And i um, wondering about the European market has always been on my goal list. Uh-huh. Um, am I mistaken in that? Um, you know, it depends. It depends. I mean, my market is much better in, in the U.S. right now. But that's just like, I mean, it, you know, there's a lot of uh, factors to that, you know. But I mean, I, I know that like London is an incredible art market too, you know. Mm-hmm. But then and then there's Paris and whatever, but it depends on how you get like into there, you know, who introduces your work, who can show it, you know, how you get there, and what's the context and how people jump on it, you know. Okay, so when you say how you get there, any advice? Any? <laughs> no, not really. Yeah. I mean, for for me, it worked in a way that that like 
you have to pay attention to windows of opportunity. Okay. That's kind of my, 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 and I saw people not pay attention and these windows, they open up and then they close, you know? Okay. Yeah. So that's the only thing I can say, you know, it's like you, you kind of, as it's, I know this is, it's a weird situation. You know, I was in New York for like almost five years without a gallery. And it's like, how do you get a gallery in New York? Once you had one, you think it's maybe easier, but then it's not, you know, and it's like, we're in this stupid situation where you can't run around, but, yeah, but look at my work, I'm doing great <laughs> stuff, you know, everybody's like, no, 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 no solitizing and like, blah, blah, blah. Like, oh no, desperate artists, stay away from me. You know, so it's, it's kind of, super unfair you know that and 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 it's like kind of i don't know how i would like but uh, you wish there would be something that would really help people look at work and like or where people could put up their work and be like here at least it's 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 visible i mean to, today it's much easier because everybody has a website at least you know but then how do you get people to look at your website you know right yeah it's it's really a conundrum i don't i, I don't have like the genius answer to that you know no, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. But try to make something that's irresistible for people. Okay. That's it. <laughs> Amy, go ahead. You're unmuted. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. I, um, I have to tell you, I was at Expo Chicago, and I took one photograph, uh -huh. um, and it was your piece. And I posted it on Facebook and I was like, this is the coolest piece. And then it was so funny that, and then you're here. And I was like, what are the chances? So I really love your work. Um, I paint mainly in encaustic and I'm kind of dabbling and uh, going back to some oil and, and cold wax and that. And so I'm curious, um, I have a couple of questions. First of all, do you work on different mediums kind of at the same time? Are you kind of, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. Do you, do you find that that kind of fuels or helps your creativity? Um, yeah, you know what I try to do is like I, I I try to find out what really interests me in that material and what, how does my work really connect to the material that I work or how can I get the best out of that material for my work you know and 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 yeah. then like as I said I'm like my work is very process oriented so if I change materials the process is a different one so and then I have to change gears in that and do different things you know and that, right. that I'm jealous that really, because I. I look at your work and, and the different mediums and it's very congruent. You know, like I can, I can look at your paintings on paper or your encaustic. I can tell it's your work where when I'm painting in different mediums, I'm just struggling, like uh, kind of trying to find my voice and trying to find some uh, congruency. So. Yeah. You kind of like, I mean, I try to have them um, come from the same, somewhat from the same spot in a certain way. I don't know how else to say that, you know, do you find that your galleries, are they, um, are they, do they favor certain mediums mm -hmm. that you create? And then yeah, yeah, you're yeah, frustrating yeah. that they don't like other mediums that you're creating or? Yeah, with galleries, it's very different. I have a gallery that works in Madrid. And um, so like I have a show up there right now and this show was like for a while in the making. And so we really together came up with a concept for the show and, and, and discussed it back and forth. And then I, 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 I like, okay, this is what we're going to do, you know, and we're both very happy with the show. And that's like an ideal situation, you know. That and is ideal, yeah. We, like, I, I made like a, um, how long is it? Three, but uh, a meter is what again? Three, in, th three feet something? Yep, three feet, three inches. Yeah. yeah. So I made like a, a 12 foot, like no, no, even longer, eight meters. Eight meters, 24 feet. Yeah, so I made a 24 feet horizontal painting for the show in Madrid because we're like, we don't want to look like we're bringing small pieces because the economy is so bad. So we went like the opposite direction and the, the dealer was okay with that. And he's like, yeah, let's do that. You know, it's more important to, to have a good show and kind of push the, the, the what you want to say than just to make a show that's just focusing on, oh, let's sell something, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Cool. Becky, hold on. Here I come. Your turn, Becky. Go ahead. Okay. This is exciting. I've been spending time as you talked looking through your website because I wasn't okay. familiar with your work. Yeah. I'm a photographer, so this is like, I don't even want to go into the techniques. I don't understand them, but I love them. Um, my question is sort of a follow up to Cheryl's because on the website, on your website, which is a very nice design, it's very, it's very cool and crisp. Um, you show representation at three galleries, and my question is, 
the outlets that you have for sales, like if somebody wants to buy your work, how do they go to one of these three galleries or are there other outlets that you have or other ways that you have to well, I get, you know i you know i like i'm very happy to not have to witness people make decisions or haggle with me over percentages and stuff like that you know and i think it's a good way where like if somebody goes to a gallery and makes this decision am i going to spend my money on this that the person that produced it and their ego and feelings and whatever is not present in that moment so that somebody wants to make a decision can make a decision in this clean room where the artist is not present you know and then you can attack the galleries for percentages or whatever you know and that's that's where the galleries earns his money you know by doing a good job in that you know and when people uh, approach me i'm like i'm always like very happy about interest and stuff but some people just want to cut like the galleries out or whatever but i always redirect redirect everybody to the closest address to them or to people that have what they're looking for. So it's like, I'm just like, here, have, go talk to those people, you know. So there's other galleries who have your work on display besides these three on your website? No, those are the people that get the work directly from me. What other people have, I can't control if somebody oh. does a resale or something. <laughs> so, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Becky. Um, David Allen, it is your turn. Go ahead. Hi, Marcus. Thank you for joining us. I have a question about uh, the German market. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in taking my work to Germany. I'm a photographer, and I do a lot of work in the southwestern United States, and I understand there's a, almost a fetish for the southwest in Germany. Yeah. I was wondering which of the cities in Germany uh, are, are really the best markets for art right now. You know, that's a tough question. I think that Cologne is still a good, good, good market for art, and Hamburg definitely, and Munich. Munich has money and galleries. Berlin is nice. You know, if you can find a place that that's great. You know, it's like I wouldn't really um, be too um, picky or so because you like if you if you if, if you get a chance, go. And that's the first. You know, my first gallery. In, in the US wasn't like the greatest gallery in the world, but it was the starting point. I was curious enough to kind of start and do something and, and take it from there. Mm -hmm. If you go somewhere and then you meet people there and then communication leads to more communication and people know people, you know, and if people like you and you can talk to people and of course you can talk in Germany because most people speak English. So it's kind of like, once you go somewhere, you, know, in the, in, in, you have the ability to spread out. You know, if you don't go there, it's not going to happen. That's right. Fine. Well, actually, we're planning a trip to Germany this summer, so maybe I'll try all of those places. <laughs> yeah, definitely. If you have the time, just do it. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. No problem. Deanna, go ahead. Hi. Thanks for... Uh for uh, being here. Um, my question is, how much international travel did you have to do to build up your career, and how much are you doing now, I suppose both internationally and within the US, to maintain your career? You know, I had a time, I had like four years where I wasn't uh, in one spot longer than six weeks. <laughs> I, can't, I recounted yeah. it, and then I was like, I was shocked. I wasn't like, when I was so in it, I wasn't really thinking, but then I was like, wow, that's pretty intense, you know. But that was also when I had a studio in Germany and in New York, so I was traveling back and forth. And it's like, it gets tiresome, you know, and so now I'm happy that I don't have to do that anymore. But, like, for example, this year, <clears throat> I've been for work in Philadelphia, and I've been in Germany just for private reasons earlier. Then I went for a show to Germany, and then I... Um, went to uh, Chicago for wall painting and then I went now I went to Miami and before that I was uh, just in Madrid and then also traveled to La Coruña in, inside of Spain so it's like mm -hmm. it was enough traveling but it's like not too much so it's kind of like a nice level right now where I go okay. when people invite me to do stuff okay mm -hmm. thanks yeah. yes, does anybody else have questions how much do you plan your career? How much do you plan or look for events? How often do you say no? Oh, I say no a lot of times. <laughs> 
there's a lot. I had a lot of galleries where I'm like, nah, I can't show there. They're like, they're like, oh, look at his bright, shiny work. I'm, I bet we could sell that. And then I'm like, nah, I don't want to do that. I just had the option to show in somewhere at Jacksonville or show like a ski resort town. Yeah, Jackson Hole. Yeah, and I was like, eh. I don't, I don't like the idea too much, you know? And it's like, if it would be a really strict, like, gallery that's like, oh, like, we're doing a great program here and we're bringing, yeah. like, contemporary stuff. But then there's, like, horses or, like, these guys in the snow somewhere, paintings, representational paintings that are not bad. But it's so, like, okay, the gallery caters to, um, like, an audience that they suspect to leave some of their winter money there, you know, and that's kind of not the context that I want to be in. So I said, no. Good. Okay. Yeah. Um, then, yeah. Mm -hmm. What about commissions? I just finished a, a, a four by 16 foot painting for the um, Presbyterian hospital here in New York. Yeah, but do you say no to commissions? Yeah, but like, you know, with working with the photos, the way I work, um, I had people approach me several times. They're like, oh, I would love to give you my family photo, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, nah, I'm not going to do that. Because it's like, it's, it's too unpredictable, you know. Then I paint over the photo, and I paint, like, the wrong things away, and then I'm screwed. So what are we going to do then? It's also, it's not interesting to me. I work with my father's photo because I'm involved in, in, in like, there's an emotional response for me to work with it those things if it's just people that i don't know i can be excited about a photo maybe that i like but then it's like it's not the real connection to that piece and then i feel like nah, i shouldn't do that it's, it's not the right thing to introduce into my work how and far I in, go ahead. and i don't want to be like the the guy who's doing like portraits of people that like can afford that or kind of you know how far into the future is your furthest show 15 or 16, not that far. I'm always surprised how sometimes like, like really kind of things pop up that you don't count on or that you can't predict, you know, and then all of a sudden I have a collector who's doing something in Detroit now and he's like, yeah, I wanted to open this space in April and I want you to be the one that's like, the, I want you to be my first show. He wants to establish some kind of a uh, Kunsthalle thing there, you know, so. I'm like, okay, let's do something in April. It's kind of, kind of tight because I have a show in um, Berlin and a, and, a, and a wall painting commission in Miami. So it's kind of like I have to squeeze it in, but it's somehow going to work. But you didn't, yeah, you didn't know you had the time when you made the commitment or you, when, when the opportunity arose? No, I just like, oh, we're going to make it happen, you know, so... You kind of try to, like, if it would be totally impossible, I would be like, no, maybe not, you know. Do you have things that you're trying to have accomplished? I mean, like you'd like to have a one-person museum show at So So in Germany. Is that or, and we're well, working? You know what? I, or, I I gave up on all of that. Like um, early in my career, things were a little frustrating, you know, because I was like, damn, I'm never getting this grant or that grant, and nobody's really what the fuck, and I'm not showing here and I'm showing there. And then like I was like mid thirties or so. And then you, like most, most things you can apply for, you can't apply for anymore in Germany, you know, because they're like age restricted. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to cancel all my art, like forum uh, uh, subscriptions. And like, I'm not going to be like, Oh God, my show wasn't reviewed, whatever. I let all, go of all of that, you know? And that was a very personal decision, but a very healthy for me, very healthy decision because it freed me, to, to like focus on what I do and not, not, not like, or get too tight, you know, because desperation, you can smell desperation and that's, that's, and you, you can sell it, you can smell it like on the dealer side and the dealer smell is on the, smell it on the artist side or curators or whatever, you know, so it's not, it's not a good odor somehow. No, sharks like it. Um, yeah. So that's yeah, you, you, you get vulnerable for, for, to, to, to get exploited when you, when you, when you open that door, you know? Yeah, but there's another decision you made that's really significant, and that is to make peace with your relationship with what happens to your art. As a person, <coughs> like, yep. my value is determined by the art world. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, if you give yourself over to that, you know, what's left of you, you know, that's also how, like, why I'm like, I never regret to 
have kids. You know, I was 28 when my son was born. And it was like, ah, that kind of sucks, you know, all the travel grants and whatever. And like, he's going to school here. I can't really do things like that, which was like, <clears throat> to, a cer- to a certain point, a little maybe painful and also maybe hurt the career a little bit because you miss out on those things where you can reach a different audience on a broader audience in certain moments, you know. But then in the end, it's like the like having a real life is also it, it's it's a good thing. <laughs> That's what I think. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Huh. <clears throat> because it's kind of tough, you know. If you if you you know, and I, I know artists that are so pissed that they're not like where they think they should be, or they get so bitter. And even like super super famous superstar artists were like, "God, that guy like the 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 Düsseldorf photo school. It's like that guy got that show and he was there already. Why my work not?" And like, and to me that's all bullshit. It's like you know, especially when you in a career where you like, you know, you like your gold. You know, there's way too many people involved in that kind of work you're never going to go down because that would lead to so much loss of money in so many collections so that people would not going to let that happen, you know? So you're like, in a way, you're secure, you know? Nothing can happen to you artistically in a, in a certain way, to a certain degree, you know? Yeah, and but then, also if you get to that certain extent, I mean, like I have a friend, an artist, and I haven't done a webinar with yet because I don't know if I can ask him this question, but he now shows with Mary Boone. Mm-hmm. It feels like he doesn't have the opportunity to experiment because if he experiments and the show doesn't do well, he's out the door. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so <coughs> he's gotten so successful that he's not successful anymore. Yeah, no, I, I have a friend who shows at Mary Boone too, who's kind of like got himself locked into something that he can't get out of anymore. Might be the same person. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Carolina, you have a question. You can go ahead. Yes. Uh, hi. How are you? Um, can you name uh, an artist who you really admire uh, and you really like? Uh, could be contemporary artist or uh, whatever. Something that you you feel yeah. it's good uh, artist for you too. I, I love a lot of artists, you know, but like it's it's kind of it's, it's kind of a tough question to pick somebody like oh this is a guy, you know. It's like I mean, name a woman then. <laughs> Sydney Sherman. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, and it's, yeah, no, that's the point. I mean, of course, there's there's like there's great women artists. I was just like, I mean, I don't know how it happened. I was invited to that dinner and sat next to Lorna Simpson, and like, she's a cool artist. You know that I love the work, and she's also a cool lady, obviously. So, yeah, no, I, I think there's there's tons of great artists out there, you know, and some more recognized, others less, you know. And I love all kinds of work. I love, like, I think Rodney Graham, yeah. like a video guy. But he also, he does his, like, I love him for that. He does his, I don't know if he's called those. He does his paintings. He sells a painting and a photograph of making the painting. So it's like, an, um, like, a, like a raw canvas, like this brown canvas. And then you have this photo. This is one, that, that piece that I love. If I would have the money, I would buy that. It's like, um, he's somewhere in this modernist LA building. It's all like 50s, cool, like furniture and everything. And he's in his PJs, and then like on the in the living room floor, there's there's like uh, newspapers on the floor, and the the painting is kind of leans to the coffee table in this angle, and then he pours paint on it, you know, and there's like two blobs already, and the third block he's just pouring, and then the paint like creates this blob and runs down very slowly, and then those paintings are also in the show, so the the photos are in the show, and the paintings in the show, and the whole thing like his the, the He's like pretty, pretty cool guy. I think with this whole attitude or his cowboy videos or whatever, where he's like singing and playing the guitar. And like, I think he's half nuts. Huh? <laughs> I, think half, I think he's half crazy. I don't know. It's funny. Cheryl, did you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> Sorry, I have another question. Sure. Um, Wait a minute. I muted you by mistake. Stop. Go ahead. You mentioned you didn't want to go into the gallery, wherever it was. Sorry, I'm not familiar with where it was. And um, how do you determine that? What are your criteria? What it's kind of things you, you look at the you look at the artist list. That's okay. the criteria. It's like you're comfortable in that context. Good. You're not not. Okay. Yeah. That's really easy, and then, and then because that tells you something about where the gallery is going or what they like, and or. <clears throat> You know, I like, I like basically, and I mean, my gallery in New York is a very like painting, painting oriented gallery, but I love that I have the gallery in Madrid 
that has photo, video, new media, everything, you know, and some painters too. So it's like more like, oh, this is where the 21st century is, you know. So I like that a lot, you know, and that's in my other galleries too. Okay, great. But, yeah, just look at the context, you know, and then you know pretty easily. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Are we done? Yes, we're done. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> no, I wonder if anybody else had questions. Not just you, Cheryl. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> Hey, Michael, I didn't know, even know you were here. You haven't even said anything tonight except volunteering your country mate's name. Um, anybody want to ask another question? Do you make art all the time, or do you make art only when you have exhibitions or art needed opportunity, you know, no. or when art is needed? No, I go to my studio every day. I love it. You take days off where you don't do anything about art? Like Not Sunday, really, we're going to no, you know, the, the thing is like, the, like, once you have a thing going, you can't really let go, you know? And then when, if, you, if you slack, then you lose the momentum and you can't afford to lose the momentum. So if things pop up, you kind of, you have to be there, you know? It, it's like, it would be nice sometimes to work a little less or so, but then on the other hand, it's like, I love what I do, so to me it's a luxury to go to my studio every day and not 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 like go to a job or something like that. Yeah, exactly. And I do that every day, you know. And it's like my assistant has to do most of the dirty work somehow, you know. So it's like I I, I really like to do what I do there, you know. And make when you say every day, do you mean seven days? I had times where I went like six days, definitely, but I somehow. Try to cut down the, the um, there's a question somewhere. I, I cut off the Saturday because I feel like my child is six now. Like the age is awesome. It's like, you know, if you don't spend the time with her, then it's like gone, you know. Yeah, probably. I, I think you're right. Yeah. All right, Michael, welcome to the show. Um, go ahead. Hey, thank you. Hey, Marcus. Hello. Um, I think what you said about not... Uh, I think the whole thing about validation and, and a whole the whole wanting of, of your validation and your ego and everything and looking for it out in the world is painful. And 99.9% .9 of artists won't get it no matter what. So they're walking into basically a minefield of depression if they expect anything from the world in terms of yeah. validation. So I really liked hearing you even, even as someone who's successful saying that uh, it's important not to get let that be important. So thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, it's also the, the thing is like, you know, like when you're inside, uh, like I know what I have to do to, to be there. And I, I, you know, it's like if people say, ah, oh, you're famous. I'm like, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. And famous is so relative, you know, it, it, and it doesn't mean, really mean too much. It's okay. So people know my work. That's great, you know, and I can live from what I do. That's awesome. But it's like, if, if you dig in, you can always find the point where it's like, and that was my that was that came from my San Francisco guy. She even said, "Marcus, you know what? There's always a better gallery, or always a bigger gallery, or always this thing where you're like in relation to where you're at. It makes you feel small or shitty or whatever. So if you go that route, it's very destructive, you know. And then, therefore, I'm a big believer in having a life, you know, a life where you have people that you like to 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 share that life with, you know, friends and stuff like that, you know. And it's like. If you're just determined by your goals, it's, I mean, it's not that I'm not ambitious. I'm really ambitious, you know. But I, 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 I think there's something like that's a healthy ambition, yeah. where 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 the ambition comes out of the passion that you carry for what you do, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, Paul had a uh, webinar on from Jessica Stockholder, and uh -huh. she was talking about somebody else who was more successful, <laughs> and I thought it was kind of funny. Because I think she's really successful. She's from Vancouver. She went to high school with my wife. So I'm like, wow. No, of course. Yeah, somebody says, Jessica Stockholder, you like look at her career. And I'm like, oh, my God. She's yeah. out everywhere, blah, blah, blah. No, yeah. she's like super. And she's stuff. talking like she's yeah. at, she has that uh, little bit of wanting in her still. You're like, wow. Yeah. yeah. Totally. <laughs> it's the same way all the way up and down the food chain. Yeah. No, th but there's people that are more, that are way more competitive, you know, and I, I think... Uh, that is like you can be like oh i'm so competitive blah blah blah. i think it's a decision it's a character thing too or it's like a di like you can people tend to be more competitive than others i think yeah but i i don't want to live my life thinking that everything that i do is a competition because how sad is that you know yeah yeah i i know an artist from 
local who keeps going to New York and doing videos and talking to everybody. And he's wanted to be famous since he was like 18 or 17. And I, I see him present at, at art fairs and different things. And I'm kind of amused by his drive. He's so determined to be successful. His, his artwork is me, <laughs> but he's getting a name for himself. So yeah. no, no, yeah. people, people do stuff and they like, I mean, they, they sacrifice a lot, you know, so sometimes they get there. What yeah. that I did in Nuremberg in the console, there was also this artist who lived once lived in LA. His wife is from LA. Now he lives in Berlin. His Vita still says like lives in LA in Berlin. And I asked him, Oh, you live in LA and Berlin. That's kind of, there's some traveling involved. It's like, he's like, yeah, nah, nah. By now I live in Berlin. You know, my wife speaks German and like, like has a right. dog there. So it's like, no, nah, that's for the Vita. They like live in Berlin and LA. But then he's like, under under circumstances where I would be living in that town that I come from, which is like the Detroit of Germany, as I said before, it's like, oh, oh, you're from Dortmund, and then he would be over with me. But in that context where I'm like, yeah, I live in Brooklyn, you know, and I have a gallery in New York, he's like, oh, and then he cuddled up to me, you know. Yeah. Okay, nice enough guy, whatever. But then I, I like I hung out with him a little bit. It turned out he was a total asshole and total dick. You know, it was like so unfriendly to the to the people at the museum and like everybody just has to had to jump for him and everything like that kind of whole attitude. I was so appalled. I'm like, okay, I don't even want your email or nothing. I'm just gonna yeah. forget about you. Yeah, I think it's hollow for some people. You know, yeah. there's an emptiness when they get there. So yeah. Well, yeah, I don't want to judge too much, you know, because that doesn't mean anything either. But it's just like, okay, like I'm walking away from that guy. I don't, don't need to talk to that guy anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Sam. Go yeah. ahead, Sam. Yeah, hi. It's me again. Um, you know, you've, you've reached a certain amount of success and you're able to make, um, you know, decisions um that aren't necessarily going to be um based around money and like the previous um art expert we had on before she, you know I, I it seems like you're not looking at how much money you know you're going to be making you know in terms of if you do this body of work it's going to produce you know you know 50 g's you know um so it sounds like you know you really follow your instinct in terms of your creative path and that the yeah, art is yeah. guiding you versus I you know I think that that's something that also that's not teach nowhere you know it's like how do I connect what I do uh, the artistic work to the market and to the money that's involved you know yeah and you kind of it's like you have to make decisions about that too you know how, yeah. how do you go about it and 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 like I mean the, the thing is like when you start out you have to be cheap. You want your work out there and you want to have many people to buy it as possible and you want like to get something rolling, you know, and then yeah. carefully can raise prices, you know, but first you have to kind of push it out there. And then I just also, and that's, that was also a decision. I decided if I go to the studio, I'm not going to think about money because that's not good. I could make like a ton of ultramarine blue paintings, you know, people would love yeah. them and buy them, but it's like, why would I do that? You know, it's not right. really what I, what I want to do, you know, so, but then also you have to, once you have something and you have the momentum, it's like, don't throw it away, you know, even if you, but there's this, this really tricky yeah. point where, where that kind of work, as we said before, and as like Paul mentioned, it's like all of a sudden you get locked in, you know? Yeah. And once you had something and then artists are also like, I'm a genius. Like this was awesome. The next shit I come up with is going to be awesome and genius too, you know, and that sometimes is not the case. And then the average mm -hmm. career of people that get somewhere is five years, you know, as well. So there's like, there's a lot of stuff you can, you, you can screw up there as well, you know? Yeah. So you have to kind of be aware of all these things, but I think yeah. a very healthy attitude is to like that point where the work comes out of that passion and that passion should not be filtered by, by dollar signs, you know? And then I think that, and then it's like, okay, create something that, that people really want or where, where you trigger something, you know, and that can, yeah. I mean, that like, as these days, everything can be sold finally, you know, it's not that there's artwork out there that's not sellable anymore. Right. Well, wow, thank it's like you. The whole thing, like, ah, oh, my work is so, like, so really, like, not commercial and anti, blah, 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 whatever. That doesn't really count anymore. You know, like, there was Joseph Boyce, you know, and all yeah. kinds of stuff. And then Mansoni was shooting cans and whatever. So it's all been out there, you know, all the provoca provocations. Yeah. Done and uh, 
So I like just, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Somebody commented, you commented, Marcus, about five years to get from something to something. You want to clarify that? What was that? No, the, the, the five years is like, the, the, that's kind of an average artist career. You get somewhere, you get oh. a little bit of attention, you're in good shows, you have a momentum that goes for five years, and then it's like, boop, and you're gone. And, then it, and that happens a lot, too. And then it's really hard to come back, you know. But also, you know, I have a really good friend who was like, had a real track on. He showed with Peter Doig and 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 um, the, the guy who was at Gagosian, and all the painter. Um, you know, he was in that group from U.S. painters, and they were all shipped to to Saatchi and everywhere and blah blah blah. He showed with Tanya Banaktar, but then he was like, he started a a, 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 a company, and then the company became his. Um, his life because he would make his money there it became his security and then he let go of the painting part mostly but then he also and then he changed his work and then he was like it was all and he's never going to go back or come back he's still painting and still he can afford to have a really nice studio but it's like i don't think the work's ever going to go back to a point where what once was you know so interesting well hmm. And in response to what Michael's not commenting here is, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think that there are different truths, and I don't think there is any one truth, and I don't think there's a yeah. single answer for what is successful. And yeah. I don't try to present people's opinions here that necessarily agree with me or with you. I try to present a wealth of, a breadth and a wealth of information so that you can find out what resonates for you. You know, and maybe you can try more than one thing, or like Marcus says, you know, over time things evolve, things change, you learn, you move. I, I know you understand it. I'm just throwing it into everybody else. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's important to find out um, what makes you tick. My yeah. Path. yeah, and what I what I really want to stress again is like it's 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 um, it, like a lot comes from personal decisions, you know. And if you if you feel feel good with the decisions you make, you know, it's way clearer what you're going to do and where you're going to go you know if you don't do things that you think that are expected or you think that an artist has to do you know that, yeah. at least that that's how my life worked you know and that's what's important yeah. Sarah Louise you get the last comment question go ahead thank you um Marcus I wanted to thank you for being such a wonderfully open speaker and to commend you for your healthy attitude to everything. <laughs> Thanks to me, you've got a wonderfully balanced life. And I think quite apart from art, you're a model for a lot of people. For <laughs> lots of yeah, you know, I just, I, I just believe in, in that we're all like, you know, human beings are kind of like the same, you know, we need the same things. And we also, we, we, we are the same. And it's kind of like, you know, there's been these, it's 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 kind of it's it's nice to be a nice person, you know. You can be an asshole, but that's a decision, you know, too. I agree. It's it's, it's not a lot of fun. It's like, and you know, and who wants to hang out with the asshole? Absolutely. I wondered also if you made any art with your daughter. Oh yeah, she's like super creative. I mean, I have one child that go that's already in art school, so it's like my wife is like, ah, you're crazy now. This, one. but she's like super creative, so. Like she, she she draws and does stuff all the time. Sometimes she, she hangs out in the studio a little bit. But she's also she's six year old. You know, that's like that's when when everybody is like like all kids want to create stuff. You know, and it's so natural and it's just amazing to see you know what they do and how they do it and how the thinking then translate into doing. It's it's awesome. You know? Yeah. Um, Wonderful, Marcus. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. We have... I'm going to stop the recording. Let me, wait, let me unmute everybody. Everybody's unmuted. Marcus, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Marcus. 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 Thank you, Marcus.